Welcome to the Fat Emperor podcast. I'm your host, Ivor Cummins. We're supported by the Irish Heart Disease Awareness Charity, which advocates a simple CT scan to reveal your CAC score. So know your score and take action to prevent that premature heart attack. Everything you need to know will be right here. Um, so, uh, yeah, what else would you like to know? Well, no, I, I'll just, that's, that's a great summary of the kind of the high level view of, of ferritin. And when I got my 530, I didn't have a clue what it meant, even though as a biochemical engineer, you know, I'd never got into ferritin as, as such. The doctor was a little concerned and because a lot of people in Ireland relatively have hemochromatosis, I think we're like 2% of the population instead of 05 I got the genetic Very test. High. Yeah. So I got the genetic test for it. Uh, I also was high in GGT, the liver enzyme, which I later found out was a huge marker for metabolic syndrome and insulin resistance. And um, I began to research it and I actually started with ferritin and I could not believe in the first two nights exactly what you say, Dennis. The linkages to mortality made LDL as a risk factor look like a joke. <laughs> I mean, it was, it was stunning. And the same with GGT. But there was a study, and you mentioned below 100, and I agree entirely. There was one study that I found that showed carotid atherosclerosis, right, that was examined in men and women. And basically, below 50, the rates of carotid atherosclerosis were really low. And above 50, just that split, uh, they were way higher, like six, seven times higher. But the interesting thing was that the women who were above 50 like in, and, and pretty high, they had the same carotid atherosclerosis at middle age as men. In other words, when the ferritin was high, the women no longer had the protective effect. You know, And there are so many other studies that show pretty much exactly what you're saying. So yes, that study was great. Uh, very striking study of, of the difference in, in carotid atherosclerosis between low and high ferritin. There's a, there's a great graph with that study that's just uh, kind of blows you away when you see it. Yeah, well, I guess uh, for sure, Dennis. But the other thing is there are so many studies, many of them similarly striking. Now, a lot of them are associational. They don't prove direct causality. But I mean, just another one I got in the first week or two was LDL as a risk factor against ferritin. And the high LDL versus low LDL people, big differences. But when people were low ferritin, high versus low LDL made no difference. But as the ferritin was higher in the groups, the higher LDL made more and more difference. And I was already beginning to research cholesterol then and realizing that LDL is not an independent risk factor, really. It depends on whether you have inflammation or another problem that's an arterial insult. So it's dependent. But this graph showed it beautifully, higher and higher ferritin indicating more and more potential inflammation, and the LDL began to be a factor. Uh, but there are so many of these studies, and yet the world's interest in ferritin, even though it's a more powerful risk marker than LDL, there is no interest. It's, it's true, there's no interest. There, just, there, there are some, some researchers out there looking at it, but it's very much under the radar. Um, very little interest. I, I feel that uh, the emphasis on cholesterol since, you know, going back decades has just uh, put, you know, put the blinders on, on people, on the people in this field, the researchers, and they're, they're not seeing this. Um, there's, a, there's a very striking um, trial done by the man uh, I mentioned a while ago, Dr. Leo Zakarski, uh, this, this was a trial of, of bloodletting, of therapeutic phlebotomy. And these were men in um, uh, the, the Veterans Affairs, uh, Veterans Administration, right? So they were going to the Veterans Administration for their health care. So these are older men, uh, many of them cigarette smokers, uh, they, and they all had peripheral arterial disease so this is this is uh what it sounds like uh arterial atherosclerosis but 
not in the heart. So elsewhere in the body, uh, often in the legs. So they, they did a trial of bloodletting and they randomized these men. They, they were, uh, I'm trying to think, I think they were all men, but they might not have been. Anyway, they were very much, the vast majority were men, at least. And they did a trial of phlebotomy and their, their results were, were somewhat underwhelming in the area of heart disease. But when they analyzed the data, they found out that these men that got phlebotomies and lowered their ferritins had much lower rates of cancer than the men who had not. And even on a further analysis of the data, they, it, it's a very, a very difficult sort of study to carry out because the, the subjects have to be highly compliant. They have to come in for their phlebotomies and so on. And not all of them did that uh, regularly. And they have to calibrate the phlebotomies to figure, uh, figure out, depending on the, the hematocrit and hemoglobin of the subjects, how much ferritin they're carrying, and so on and so forth, other factors, they have to calibrate the phlebotomies. But in any case, they found that in both groups, whether the men had had phlebotomies or not, the ones that had a ferritin level of about 75 had far lower cancer rates. It was cancer mortality. They had far lower cancer mortality than men in either group who had a ferritin of about an average of 125. So, um, yes, very striking, this, this study. They looked at these men for several years. Um, and this is something that, uh, again, it, it, no, nobody knows about this. So, yes, very striking. So, um, another, um, this is not a, not a randomized controlled trial, but uh, an experiment, I guess, for lack of any other word, of doing phlebotomy uh, on, on normal people. And they find that their endothelial function goes way up when they've had phlebotomy, when they lower their ferritin levels. Um, and they found, first they found this in blood donors, frequent blood donors who give blood several times a year. They compared them to um, infrequent blood donors who give, who give blood at most once a year. So there, there's, as I discussed in my book, there's a problem here in looking at blood donors in, in regards to health. So many studies have found that blood donors have much better health, lower rates of heart disease, and so on, than non-blood donors. Um, the problem is, is that blood donors are likely to, to be healthier to begin with. Otherwise, they would not be giving blood. So uh, just to analyzing blood donors against the general population may not tell you a whole lot. So what a, a number of other researchers have done is, is compare frequent blood donors to infrequent blood donors. So uh, one study that I know of, the, the frequent donors have given blood several times a year for each of the past three years, I believe it was, and then the infrequent donors had only given blood at least once in, in those three years. And they found out that these, the, the frequent donors had better endothelial function. So what that means for arterial health, it has a significant meaning for arterial health. It means it, that, that arteries function much better, less likely to uh, get atherosclerosis, um, and as uh, someone said, you're only as old as your arteries. So this is, this is very important. Uh, other, other, uh, other studies have shown that lowering uh, ferritin levels by phlebotomy, so let me back up a little bit. The, the study I was just uh, talking about was an associational study, but other studies have shown when you actually take people and take some blood out of them, do phlebotomy on them, then their endothelial function does increase quite a bit. Right, and that's, that's direct kind of RCT type or randomized experiment to prove the point, prove causality. 
Uh, I did see one, and I'll have to pull it out now for show notes, but a very striking graph, and I think it was also peripheral arterial disease, but when they segmented from memory it's a few years ago to older people within the group the younger people not so much signal which kind of makes sense because younger people it'll be harder to see a signal for any deleterious effects older people see it easier and they had a graph of events for peripheral arterial disease events and that was recorded i think as any you know thrombus or operation or problem and there was a 66 percent reduction in the people who did i think it was two blood donations or more a year and it was randomized versus the people who didn't now technically it was randomized you could argue that the people who had the blood taken well it could have reduced their oxidized lipoproteins or it could have had some other effect but to be quite honest by occam's razor a couple of pints of blood taken won't really impact platelets and and lipoproteins so much but it will impact iron quite significantly and that's what they were testing and it's the only rct i know that was properly executed and it's kind of interesting that as such it showed a much bigger reduction in events for vascular issues than a lot of the mass market medications but but I guess, as we said earlier, there's not a huge amount of interest because I guess there's no real profit motive. There's no real research budget looking for new treatments that's going to be looking at bloodletting. For God's sake, it sounds like medieval stuff. It, it, it certainly does. Uh, therapeutic phlebotomies, are, it's, a, it's a very inexpensive therapy. Um, I, I read somewhere where the, the, average, uh, the average doctor bills uh, of $130 for a therapeutic phlebotomy. So it's just, it's just as, as medical care goes, this is dirt cheap. It just occurs to me, and I often say it to people, that there's mechanistic science behind this. I mean, we can talk in a minute without going too deep. I went through masses of papers six years ago. There's fantastic mechanistic evidence for it. There's really strong associational, but we know, as you described, it can be confounded. And then there's some experimental. So all three pillars of, of evidence are, are represented for this. Uh, but I always say to people, well, it even if it's not uh, completely a really big beneficial effect, if you're high ferritin to give blood, giving blood also helps people. So it's like a win-win. Thanks for tuning in, guys. If you're watching on YouTube, you can see my subscribe button in the middle of the screen, a free viewing of the Widowmaker movie on the far right, and myself and Dr. Gerber's book, Eat Rich, Live Long, on the left.